So today's presentation will be uh, by occupational therapist Josie Jarvis and Olivia Waldock. Welcome. Uh, we where will um, sorry. We will learn how um, sensory systems impact emotional regulation and mental health with practical tips to help us all stay calm under the pressure and sensory overload of the holidays that are coming up. Um, you can put your questions in the chat and we will get to them um, in our safe questions for after the presentation. Um, we will try to keep track of those. Um, and so now let's go to introduce our presenters. Um, Josie Jarvis um, is a, currently a doctoral student at the University of Utah. Her background in school-based practice in Washington was specialized in executive dysfunction, assistive technology, and long-term preparation for adult transition. As a lifespan occupational ther therapy clinician, she is passionate about preparing individuals with disabilities and neurodivergence with the tools and resources they will need to be, they will need to be thriving adults that are included and valued in their communities. Josie is currently developing a private occupational therapy practice and is non-medical uh, and non-medical home care agency specializing in community-based services for young and older adults, evolved living therapy, um, and evolved living. Right? Olivia Waldock is an occupational therapist who practices in outpatient pediatrics and is pursuing board certification in pediatrics in 2022. Her background is in child development and she has rich experience working with emotional regulation, sensory processing and executive functions. Olivia currently practices at Kids at Play Therapy in Puyallup, Washington, she is, is passionate about building creative solutions to support all clients to participate fully in their daily occupations. So hi, Olivia, and hi, Josie. Thank you for being here with us today. Take it away. Uh, um, thank you so much for the introduction. Um, Yana, is my audio OK for everybody? Awesome, this is Josie. Um, one of the things I probably uh, would have been good to mention too, and it's part of Olivia and I's work together is we've been very passionate about um, the role that executive functioning plays for um, humans really across the lifespan. And we are really excited to be invited back for this presentation. And last year we got to um, join with you all um, to go over executive function, which I believe is still um, available on your website. So if those of you are new and joining us today, get a lot out of this presentation, um, definitely encourage you to check that out. Um, I also have <laughs> our kind of a random background in evolutionary biology, which will probably help come out and shared, Olivia and I's shared interest in looking at sensory processing and what that means for human health across the lifespan. So we're really excited to share this information with you today. Um, I just wanted to start with a basic disclaimer. Some of the things that we're gonna be covering today um, talk a lot about kind of um, mental health and emotional processing and sensory needs, which sometimes have a need for kind of some clinical follow-up. Um, Olivia and I are both practicing occupational therapists here in Washington State. Um, however, we do wanna just kind of disclaim that this presentation we're gonna be focusing on information for the general population that um, is generally concerted not to um, hopefully cause harm in any context, but we certainly recommend that everyone pursue, um, you know, connection with a holistic uh, therapy team and work with before maybe applying some of these practices to make sure that you're in communication with your own therapist and health team. And we encourage you to uh, pursue out referrals for occupational therapists in your community if you're feeling like you might want more information beyond this. Um, however, this presentation does not constitute a therapist relationship. Uh, uh, you know, agreement um, that we will answer general questions to the best of our ability to support you today. 
So our general goals for today's presentation is to um, help everyone here understand a little bit more in depth the role of what's called co-regulation plays in sensory system development uh, throughout the lifespan for all human beings. And um, to understand for what impact that has on what we call occupational performance and our general well-being and, and the functioning in the context of our environment. Um, we really want to explore some of the practical tools that occupational therapy and occupational science has to offer. Um, over the past 50 years, we've really been one of the um, founding professions to look at the role that sensory systems play in human development, human function, and we've really advanced. Um, we've got a lot more mainstream literacy about how sensory systems impact, especially folks with disabilities, but we're learning more about how sensory systems also affect the um, overall functioning performance of all humans across the lifespan. Um, so we really want to work to support you to understand some common sensory supports and activities that can be helpful to both children and adults at home. Because what we're learning about sensory supports is it really is kind of an ecological thing where we're so tied to our environment. And so often in clinical practice, you'll see that we'll kind of focus on the sensory needs of maybe the child in the classroom, but we really need to consider um, the well-being of everyone in the environment. As we get prepared for the holidays, um, we wanna share with you kind of how we can partner with you um, to create a home context where everyone's sensory needs are a little bit more supported at home. We also wanna offer some resources for ongoing learning and time for questions. Um, we've actually prepared a PDF packet and a copy of this presentation slides that have some clickable links for resources. Um, so I'll go ahead and add that in the chat for anybody that's interested. It's no email list or anything. It will just give you access to PDFs that go along with the presentation. So to get started, um, what is occupational therapy? We're often a very misunderstood <laughs> profession. Um, we kind of got our roots uh, started in mental health actually um, during the last major pandemic that impacted our country <laughs> back in 1917. So we have been well-versed in helping humans that are going through illness, injury, disability, um, and finding ways that you can return to mental health and well-being through the therapeutic power of activity, meaningful and purposeful activity that helps humans feel included, empowered, and that they're making full use of their minds and bodies. We really believe that occupational participation is the way that we can have the most therapeutic impact. So our interventions look at how can we support participation and how can we use participation as um, a means of therapy in and of itself. We want to figure out what are those root causes to functional challenges and come up with adaptive solutions to help all the people we support get the resources they need. So this line of thought from our founding um, led us directly to look at how sensory systems impact humans' ability to function and engage in their environment. So we um, really have found that that's actually a consistent root cause to dysfunction, not just for folks with disability, but really across the lifespan. So we're excited to share some of this science with you. Um, so to get start, you actually kind of have to look at um, where, you know, humans fall in an evolutionary perspective. So we are mammals, and this is where that evolutionary biology is kind of helpful, but um, just like every other mammal in the animal kingdom, we're incredibly develop dependent on our sensory receptors and creating an accurate picture of our external world. So most of us know those basic senses like vision, hearing, tactile, and we'll go more in depth on each of those systems later in those presentation. But it's helpful to know the function of why those systems exist. And it's because we have to navigate our environment with reliable data about what's actually happening in the present moment. And when our brains develop with um, systems that are very receptive to our external environment, we can develop an internal map that helps us really accurately understand what, where we're situated in the environment and what we need to do. So the sensory data actually starts um, developing before our you know, conscious parts of our brain. So even as a fetus, we're taking in auditory input, we're taking in um, pressure and tactile input. Some of it is actually kind of muted because we're in this environment that kind of dampens down naturally some of the sensory input. Um, some infants actually, um, if they're born prematurely, 
will get hyper saturated with a lot of sensory data. And that's where we can see a lot of sensory imbalances later on. But um, the reason I'm bringing this up in part two is that when we look at mental health and mental health functions and um, in how that impacts human functioning is we often leave out the whole body in that holistic perspective. And we really understand that if the, if the human brain and our mental health doesn't have accurate information about the external world, that naturally triggers a flight or flight response. Because if you think of an animal that doesn't have vision or doesn't have data, it's gonna think that it's very vulnerable at all times. So when we're looking at um, sensory supports, we're trying to help to give the foundations of the brain the information that they need to feel safe and confident that you can take on new learning and new challenges and respond to threats with a calm state of confidence. So that's really what we're looking for. Um, and as you guys likely know from having children yourself, the human brain does not fully develop after getting pushed out into the world. <laughs> and that's true of our sensory systems as well, as they take a long time to develop and they're actually responding to inputs continuously and continuing to adapt as our environment changes. Um, what's great about that is it means that we actually as therapists can mediate that these systems aren't fixed. We can actually work on different supports throughout development to give the brain and the foundations of the body what it needs to continue to grow and development, develop. Um, and this is really an area that Olivia specializes and thrives in. So I'm excited to pass along the torch to her. <laughs> So we're going to talk about what is sensory modulation and processing later on too, because this is kind of the bread and butter of pediatric OT. It, however, is only one prong of the sensory system, sensory integration therapy. Um, and it's all about how we filter input from our world so that we can use it fast and efficiently and correctly. And when that filter gets clogged or it is not paying attention quote unquote, to enough input, it makes our internal map, as Josie described, not quite right or not quite finished. Um, and so that's really important for us to address modulation and processing as a piece of the pie for how we regulate our emotions. Um, and then we're also going to talk about how we organize sensory input to have an organized sense of self in our environment. It kind of goes back to that modulation and processing piece. Um, and then, yeah, co-regulation is back to Josie. <laughs> oh, sure. So think if it. you think about, so um, Olivia will go more in depth later about each of the sensory system and kind of the timeline of how those develop for most typical developing humans. And if, you know, some of us may have children that develop atypical, and then those timelines might actually be longer. So one of the adaptations that humans have as mammals is if your you know, body isn't fully developed yet or your brain isn't fully developed, we have this handy trick where we just kind of match to whoever seems like the most calm and confident adult in the room. We're very like tribal creatures and we use kind of what we observe in the supportive humans around us as direct feedback about how to um, sort of match our nervous system because we really wanna follow whatever is working for our community and whatever is helping. So if, if we don't have it fully developed yet, we mimic and we copy and we regulate. And this is a really ancient part of our brains. We can see this in chimpanzees. We can see it all over. When in doubt, we regulate and match um, particularly to the maternal presence, but really any nervous system in our environment, we just tend to match to it, um, which kind of is a little scary, but in some ways is like also, again, this great opportunity for us as supportive adults in all of these children's lives is that we, through regulating our own nervous system and supporting our own sensory needs, we have this little bit of a life hack where we can help support the nervous system and development for kind of all the humans around us. And that's why we really want to pass on that through co-regulation and meeting everyone's sensory needs in our little ecosystem here, we can support all of our developments and well-being. So that's really a big part of this conversation is to broaden it out. We're used to talking about sensory needs for kids with autism, kids with ADHD and everything, but we're not so used to realizing that these sensory systems are actually part of core human biology. So that's why 
co-regulation will be a big focus of the presentation today. So there is, so she talked about, you know, we tend to think of sensory processing disorder and sensory needs of people with neurodevelopmental disorders. But again, we're going to kind of bring that back to saying that everybody needs, has sensory needs and sensory needs are universal. So there's kind of the treatment plan, if you will, for when your nervous system isn't taking in information correctly. And then there's also recognizing that everybody has these needs. Everybody has moments of dysregulation throughout their life and everybody needs to be supported. So there's kind of a difference between general sensory supports and strategies and tools that you'll see out there that are maybe physical tools and actual sensory integration treatment. Um, we're gonna kind of try and focus on practical tips that aren't necessarily just physical tools because we are kind of OTs that believe in using your body first and then using your environment as you have it and not necessarily focusing on adding things because we all don't wanna spend all this kinds of money on tools that maybe only work at home or only work at school. We wanna make sure you have ideas that work everywhere you go. That and, and that being said too, there are also clinical presentations of significant sensory imbalances yes. and, and significant um, adverse child experiences that certainly necessitate seeking a clinical occupational therapy referral formal assessment, you might need more than what's offered in this general presentation. And that's where maybe you would work with somebody like um, Olivia or other occupational therapists in your community to get more in-depth assessment and customized treatment plans. There are protocols that are evidence-based and trying to address this clinically. These are general human supports. <laughs> Uh, so this is just some images that um, when, I, for example, when I first started taking neurology and anatomy and physiology classes, it was pretty mind blowing to me to learn that there are actually neurons all over your body. I, I thought that they were just in your brain and that was kind of the self-contained system. Um, but as I got to learn about neurology and anatomy and physiology kind of in tandem, it was helpful to see how all of this fits on the big picture because like our whole body is connected and communicates through this like commute computer in our brain at all times and it really needs accurate data from every part of our body and our environment in order to fully develop and function. I think having that big picture perspective is really helpful here. Um, so if you see sort of the colors on the brain, each one of these, like we've been able to get to the point with the neurology where we've mapped out certain areas where data from other points in the body help build out a little program <laughs> for how our external and our social world operates. Um, so like there's a special part of our brain that takes in the data from our hand, for example, or um, maps out the um, tactile input. So these here are called dermatones, which is a map of um, the neurons that are um, specifically given the job to take in temperature and pain receptors. And it, they have a, a, a wire that directly maps out to this area and communicates up and sort of builds out the program in different parts of our brain. And the, in our brain, we do this thing that's called a cephal to cicadal. Do you know the technical term for that, Olivia, by chance? <laughs> So it's the, it's the order of development. It always starts top down, right? So no, bottom, bottom up, up, right? It's, up, sorry. it's bottom up. So like we, we've dealt from bottom up in from the middle out and it, each one of those has a kind of a rhythmic sequence of data. And that's part of how we can calculate when certain milestones and certain reflexes aren't hit because there are there is a precise sequence to how these neurons and these programs get fit, filled out. And with humans, we're incredibly plastic and we need a lot of current data to build out these systems. Um, there are other creatures that are born and kind of have a instinct-based system that's already pre-wired to be in you know, relation to that environment, but we're very plastic. So we need a lot of data to map out how our brain works. And so it's this partnership and this dance between our physical bodies and the external world. And we try to make those things match up as well as possible. 
And um, we're also incredibly responsive, not only to the external world, but to the people in our tribe. We really match out what those things are. So I just wanted this slide to give that um, view that our brain isn't just trapped in our school here. It actually has wires out to almost every part of our external world and is designed to try to make that data as accurate as possible. And that's why when we look at mental health, we really are missing something if we're not taking in a full body and full brained perspective. So what are the sensory systems? I know you guys probably have a basic understanding of those, but I just wanted to go over it in case you don't and because some of them aren't as clear cut as you might have heard. So this is a pyramid of the central nervous system and how we develop our general skills for living. <laughs> Um, it needs to be updated. It's from 1996. It doesn't include interoception. Um, but as you can see, all of the sensory systems are on the bottom. They are foundational for learning, which is all the way at the top of the pyramid. And so what you'll often see in pediatric OT is that we are working all across that pyramid. We are working top down to build those skills and train those skills. And then we're also working bottom up to fill in the blanks of any foundational pieces that are missing or not working quite right for that person. So tactile system is your skin. It's your sense of touch. It's also your largest system because you have so much skin to take in information. This is also the system that's going to really tie into your emotions, surprisingly enough. Um, and it's very visceral. Sometimes we're gonna take in information in through our skin and it's gonna cause an, an emotional reaction and we don't necessarily connect the dots right away. And so that is why we need the other systems to help make sense of that. Um, vestibular is your sense of balance and trunk control where your head position is in space basically. Um, really, it's all about protecting your head, and your brain. Um, and it's housed in your inner ear. So it's very interconnected with your sense of hearing because hearing is also in your ear and that's your auditory system. Vision is your sense of sight. It's your eyes and it's your, it's, it's a very fast input for us because um, it's right at the brain, um, has right in the, in, in the head. So your hearing and your sight are very fast inputs. Um, and those are probably our two most known and most used throughout our day. Um, and then you've got proprioception, which is housed in our muscles and our joints. And it tells us movement, location, and action. So what are we doing? Where are we doing it? Where in space are we doing it? And also how fast, how far, how much pressure are we using? It's very much about how we refine our movements to be successful in our environment. And this is the most commonly disrupted in neurodevelopmental disorders and also the most important for connecting the dots of all your all of your other sensory systems. So if we looked back at that brain image, we don't have to change the slide back, but I can tell you, you use the back of your brain for processing vision, you use the sides of your brain for processing hearing, and in the middle is your motor and sensory cortexes, and that's what's connecting all the other information. So your pro proprioceptors need to be active, to be a almost like a roadway or a pathway or a highway, if you will, for all of the other senses to get through fast and efficiently and make sense of those other senses, if you will, make sense of the senses. <laughs> so this is why we, if you hear us saying heavy work, depressure, heavy work, depressure over and over again in OT, it's not that we're trying to be a broken record, it's that it's super important to, how we regulate our bodies. It's kind of like the GPS system, right? Like if you don't know where you're going in your car, like that's a, like that's a problem. <laughs> if you don't know where you are in space when you're trying to get somewhere, right? Um, and if you think about it, you know, you can see that there's a coffee table in front of you, but if you can't judge how far away it is, you know, that it's stagnant, it's not gonna move towards you um, versus somebody walking towards you, that doesn't give you as much information, right? You need to have that information from the proprioceptors in addition to your vision to navigate your so world. I am so sorry to interrupt. Is there any possible way that we could stop with that so I can actually see the pyramid and and instead of the words that are just continuously going up the screen? I am so sorry to interrupt. 
the um so you can um if you have are you talking about closed captioning this is yana sorry yes i was i'm sorry <laughs> so so you can just click on the cc live transcript and turn it off for yourself that's for for everyone's um where is that at i'm sorry that would be that's okay so uh on the lower i mean my control bar is on um on the bottom of the screen and you will see a mute start video security participate you know etc and you get to one icon that says cc cc for closed captioning do you see that And you will click on the CC. Melody, do you see that? I don't at all. I am so sorry. Yeah, no worries. Oh. Um, so so we, I think what I can do is I'm actually going to send a link out, which has a link to the slides that you can open in your own computer too. Mm -hmm. So oh, I'll send okay, that out amazing. right now. Okay, perfect. I am so sorry. Thank you so much. I did not Ooh, mean to interrupt you guys at no, all. You're fine. Don't Perfect. worry, we would rather you to be able to participate in. Yeah, so I sent that link out right there. It should pull up a web page where you can click to see the Google slides. Right under the chat. Thank you thank for letting you. us know. OK, thank you. OK, we good. Can I, can I say one thing, Olivia, while we we're on like proprioception? Yeah is that if you can imagine if your body doesn't know where it is in space and you think about that animal that evolved these systems for a reason to like usually evade predators i feel like it's more common sense why having proprioception be off would link to mental health right because like that's a very scary thing to not know where your body is in space right yes and this is why again this is where i spend a lot of my time is in proprioception because when that's off or if it's not processing the other senses for kids, I would equate it to feeling like you're drunk and just walking around the world constantly feeling like that, which would feel terrible, right? Like you don't feel in control and that's very nerve wracking and distressing and dysregulating for, for the body and the brain and the mind. Um, so this is why these are so important. Um, olfactory is your sense of smell, it's housed in your nose. Fun fact is that the part of the brain that processes smell is in the memory parts of the brain, which is why we see a lot of use of senses smell for um, people with dementia and why it is very tied to trauma sometimes for people um, because a smell will trigger a memory that's traumatic. And so again, working on integrating and processing and dampening systems. But yes, this is kind of an underrated system, but important nonetheless. And it's also, I would say taste and smell and touch are-, are Strongly um, linked. Yes, there are ones that tell us like immediate dangers, I guess with foods, if you will. Um, most so mammals evolutionary yeah most mammals are um incredibly dependent on pheromonal communication <laughs> we're lucky we can like observe how other humans are behaving and we can match to their nervous system but um other animals depend a lot on smelling the hormones from other animals and um from that it's like still even though it's not as dominant in humans it's still a very ancient part of us and like very linked to survival so taste and smell, again, when they're disrupted, can be dysregulating to those ancient part of our brain. So our limbic system is that emotional part. And it's one of our most ancient. So it's important, um, which is, is not fun, but at the same time, there's also an opportunity through sensory systems to intervene when sometimes talk therapy doesn't. Sometimes when we get the sensory thing right, it can be very calming to the overall system. So off of that, our sense of taste is our tongue, but it's actually called your gustatory system because it's not just the tongue, it's all of the sense, the um, what I would call oral tactile receptors in your mouth and then down your throat as well. Um, there's an uh, autonomic nervous system component to the gustatory system. So that brings in a whole other bag of issues that can happen. Um, but yeah, so our we rely heavily on vision and auditory systems to stay safe. All of these are built to keep our bodies safe, right? 
are as humans use vision and auditory mainly, but our, we can't count out our nose, our sense of smell and our sense of taste and our sense of touch either. Um, they give us important information that we need to listen to as well. The, uh, the one that you might not have heard of is interoception. This is our internal body state awareness. So am I hungry? Am I thirsty? Am I hot? Am I cold? Do I need to go to the bathroom? Do I feel sick? Am I in pain? Am I bleeding? Um, am I going to faint? All of these things are our internal body systems telling us information of is something wrong or is it going right? And it is commonly associated with acute or chronic traumas. So, you know, you cut yourself and you don't notice right away, or you cut yourself and it feels like you're dying. Um, you have chronic illness and you are desensitized to pain. All of these things can happen. We also work with this a lot with toilet training. It is a skill to be aware of your internal body states. It's not something that we just automatically are perfect at, which is why we have to toilet train which is why sometimes toilet training takes a while, doesn't always go right, sometimes has regression. Um, and again, this one's highly related to our emotional states. Um, you will see children who um, enter in kindergarten or have a new sibling born regress in their toilet training or in their um, just in general interoception during those highly emotionally dysregulating moments. Um, so yeah, it's, again, it's kind of an, an adaptive risk. I'm sorry. Like part of what is adaptive, unfortunately about this one is that if we ever get internal emotions or something that are beyond our ability to process them developmentally, we'll actually sort of have an adaptive response to disassociate with it because <laughs> our yep. body like doesn't want us to process things unless we're safe enough to do so which if we're under chronic stress, as most kids with disabilities are, or in just all of us in a post-COVID-19 thing, our bodies are trying to protect us by dampening down the input of interoception if it is functioning then, which is why we actually have to be intentional about creating enough uh, safety to actually go through and process these things. These things could be kind of ruling the show for our bodies and we would be totally unaware of it. And that's where we're going to kind of talk about some current practices that are available to help us, especially as an adult, build more familiarity with the system because it really takes a lot. Of, it's very challenging work. A lot of us actually need to work with therapists in order to do this well. This is Yana. Can I just ask a quick question? So do you mean like, is it self-awareness or like? Yes. So this is our body awareness, like our internal body awareness. So we have our external body awareness, which is more, more of our proprioception. And then our internal body awareness is our body systems. So for example, I have kids who are not very connected to their interoception and will forget to go to the bathroom if they're in the middle of play. Um, we have other kids who are hyper aware of their internal body systems on the other, you know, opposite side of the, that spectrum. And they are just uncomfortable all the time because they feel like they have to pee all the time or they, you know, feel like they are hungry all the time or feel like they're thirsty all the time or they feel very minute changes in the temperature. <laughs> yep. Um, so this can be very dysregulating because then they're, attention, their brain's ability to filter input is now all on their internal body systems and not paying attention to the external world. And that's really hard um, because then you can't really keep yourself safe emotionally, physically, socially um, in your environment. And so that's another cause for dysregulation would be is, is if you're either too aware or under aware of what's going on with your body. And again, this is a skill that's built over time. You know, you're not born going, oh, I know what that feels like, but you are born with some awareness. This is why babies cry is because they're, that's their way of saying, hey, see me, I need help, something's wrong. And it's our job to attune to their different cries to decide if that means they are hungry, if they need to go to bed, or if they have, need a diaper change or if they have gas, those type of things. 
So it starts in, in infancy and we build those skills over time. Um, and again, coming back to care regulation, it's this constant dance between us and our caregivers as we grow up. Um, and then even into adulthood, it's our dance with our partners and our friendships and our families and our children even to meet our needs back and forth, back and mm -hmm. forth. As we become parents, or if you are somebody that was, you know, took strongly to maybe a caregiving role, um, they, there can be a way where we get attuned very well to the needs of our kids and things, and that can come with being less connected to our own internal needs. So that's kind of the challenge is balancing out connection to our own interoception while supporting the um, communication that our kids have and our students have around us. And i um, excited to see, share some tools around this. Um, ultimately, if you guys can still see this pyramid, you can hopefully see that all of these systems are interrelated and are very important to get to that spot where we are capable neurologically of focusing on new learning and challenging tasks. And it's sort of like, um a orchestra where everything needs to be conducted at the right times and the right ways in order for the full system to function and if something on the foundation is off like the violinist arrived late or something the orchestra isn't gonna sound as great and isn't gonna be as capable of moving up the pyramid um but uh, there are all sorts of different opportunities that we have as supportive adults in scaffolding that loss of uh, orchestra practice or whatnot. Um, and I just wanted to include rhythm on this slide because rhythm, while that's not necessarily a sense in the body, it is like a force that has a way of synchronizing the data from a lot of these different systems and is one of the more common tools. And Olivia, did I cut you off? Was there anything else that no, I think that was like the perfect um, okay. segue. So if we're doing this dance with each other, then the rhythm is kind of our tool, what Josie often calls our life hack, um, making things work, right? So we want a rhythm between us and our child, um, us and our friends, us and our family, us and our partners to all feel like our needs are being met in order to feel, feel safe in our environment. And a lot of our, you know, ancestors and things like that, right, they used um, the rhythms of the external environment were very calming. They got to be on, you know, sunlight and daylight and moonlight, and they got to live with these, you know, sequenced patterns. We have to be a little bit more intentional in how we build in those rhythms in our external world. And we're going to share with you kind of how knowing this information you can work with and finding some daily routines and daily harmonies that your body will learn to trust you if you can reliably show up to all the different sensory systems. And as you build an internal awareness of where your body is at, um, your body's voice doesn't have to get extra louder in order to get your attention, but it will start to trust you and it'll help you maintain a regulated state. Um, and that's where we're gonna be part of that, you know, annoying uh, mainstream thing that talks unendingly about mindfulness and meditation and stuff like that, which is because part of that core rhythm of the body is we can always come back to the breath and the heartbeat that's always stable. And if you're in touch with that, it has a way of calming your whole system. So from there, we'll go into our next slide here. This is Yana. I, I'm just wondering if you can, you know, I, I get it that you're talking about the caregivers, right? How do we um, take care of ourselves so we can get that oxygen mask and support our kids? Um, can you uh, also talk about how how we teach that, or maybe that's coming up. I don't that's know. coming up for sure. And it really is because it is, um, this is how those systems develop. So for our kids, which is a perfect segue for Olivia to go in, how do actually sensory systems develop Olivia for our, those of us yeah. that are younger than adults, right? Hold on my screen. Thing keeps oh, sorry. Getting in the way. Is it just me or do you guys have the blue? Um... Do you know how to get rid of those? <laughs> I don't. Um, it, hold on. Let me see if I can do something. 
somebody is drawing. There we go. Sorry, I had a problem. Okay, well, I can draw something else, but how can I erase it? <laughs> Maybe there's an eraser off. Um, here, I got it. Let me find it. Oh, it's not letting me erase it. Never mind. Only the person who can draw can erase, I think. That somebody works. did it. Thank oh, you. There it is. Okay. It's gone. So thank you. When does sensory systems are fully developed? So I don't know if you guys knew this, but this is important information to keep in our minds of how kids emotionally regulate because they're still developing, right? So our tactile systems are fully developed around the age of three years. Um, so we got to give them time, right? And then vestibular is already developed five months gestation. So already before they're even born, babies are good to go ready to know where their head is in space, probably because this is very important to keep them alive, right? Um, keep their head safe. Proprioception isn't until adulthood. So this is gonna take as long as our brain itself takes to fully develop, our proprioceptors are still refining. And I found this because the research is saying like even athletes are still refining as they go into adulthood, as they're going into college sports, as they're going into, you know, the NFL or whatever. It's still constant refinement up until our brain is fully developed. So I think that's important for us to kind of pin in our brains that, oh, these, some of these systems take a long time. Um, olfactory is around the age of five years. Vision is actually two years old. Auditory is only four to eight months, so their hearing is already fully developed um, before the age of one. Gustatory, our sense of taste, refines by age 12 to 19 months, which makes sense because they're not even starting solid foods until around six months. Um, and then interoception is around three to five years, so think around potty training time. So this is just to give you guys a good idea that these things take time. <laughs> And these things get refined with constant practice within our environments. And so if you're seeing a problem in one of these areas and it's if your child is younger than the typical, you know, full term age, quote unquote, then maybe give them more time. But if they're older and they're still having problems, maybe it's time to go see someone and get supports. Olivia, do you mind if I connect this to Yana's question yeah. from earlier? So if you can remember on one of our first slides in talking about human development and how we have come up with some adaptive hacks for when our systems aren't fully developed. When these systems aren't fully developed, we are hardwired to match to whoever is the most fully developed in the room in for guidance for what to do, because this is basically how long it takes for this brain to build an app accurate map of the universe that you're navigating. It's like if, if human bodies are little spaceships that are navigating this outer world, this is how long it takes to collect enough data to have an accurate internal representation of the external world. Until you have that map, you're dependent on other people to be that GPS system and let you know where you're going and how to match your um, internal and external world together. So as occupational therapists that become specialists in sensory integration, we become graduate level trained co-regulators for your kids. We are, you know, little scientists that are figuring out where is your map missing a piece and how can I get your system that data and I'm going to put it here and we um, become, you know, kind of professionals at self regulating. So we can guide that nervous system of your child onto a much more, you know, rapid pace of development to get that data that they need. If we're not there or there's not a clinical need for occupational therapy. Um, you as the supportive and guiding adults and the nervous systems that are hopefully spending a good amount of time um, with your students and kids at home, they're going to match to your nervous system the parts where they're delayed or they're regressed, which is why, unfortunately, we can't really opt out of this co-regulation piece. It's just like part of the hard wire of how these systems developed. And that's why it's that annoying constant evolves of the we have to take care of ourselves first. If we can learn these tools, because this science wasn't even really out when Olivia and I were born, right? This is just available now. And humans are so neuroplastic 
that even as adults going into our 40s, 50s, 60s, I, and I've used these tools for folks with dementia in their 80s and 90s that are responding amazingly to finally getting the appropriate sensory supports that their nervous systems have always needed. So we're here to kind of be missionaries that honestly, the best way to support your kids' sensory needs and development at home is also using these tools and modeling for yourself, because no matter what, your kids are going to role model for you. Talk therapy isn't as powerful as demonstrating, showing up, concretely meeting our needs. If you can get a whole body experience as part of your mental health program, you're going to get much more rapid progress and much more optimal development for not just you and your kids, but just everyone around you is going to naturally start matching to your regulated system. It's just like such cool work. So we're excited to share it with you. Oh, so this translate, translates well about how this loops back to what we call occupational performance and sensory modulation. These are the goals of occupational therapy intervention overall and why we care about investigating sensory systems in the first place. And really our goal here is to get that orchestra already and practiced so that they can, you know, show up with a symphony for a majority of our everyday experience. And we want to help it be organized and consistent. So every part of your body is speaking cohesively to the other part and giving accurate information to the upper part of your brain. So your executive functions are on fire and ready for new learning, new challenges, new, and new challenges. And this is part of why, like I said before, mental only supports that are addressing the cerebral cortex, but missing the underlying foundation might not have the strongest mental health outcomes for things like trauma and anxiety, because that is your body's speaking out about what it needs, which speaks the language of sensory systems and not necessarily always words. So we kind of really need a tandem of both so that your whole brain is active and present and taking on new learning and new challenges. Um, and this is where sensory supports are directly tied to emotional regulation strategies, which is going to be one part of this presentation as well. And it's a really amazing thing knowing that we can support the brain through sensory supports, because once you start speaking that language, your body will start to naturally calm and you maybe make progress that would have taken like, I don't know, five years in talk therapy all you needed was like a bubble bath and some nice warm cozy food and now you get that you know nice calm regulated state um so this is um from tina champlain who is like the foremost expert on sensory processing particularly for mental health and adults um i actually included on the slide you can get a free webinar that's <laughs> way like blows this one out of the park on mental health and sensory processing. Um, but her promise is, is learning how to utilize sensory modulation strategies. You are going to have increased self-awareness, increased ability to self-nurture, increased resilience, increased self-esteem and body image, increased ability to engage in therapeutic activities, self-care activities, meaningful life roles, social activities, and increased ability to cope with triggers. So now when I look at this list, I see everything I want for every young person, child, and student I have ever worked with as a therapist. <laughs> and the cool thing about this and what we know about co-regulation is if we can develop these skills ourselves through the power of co-regulation and role modeling alone, we're going to go light years ahead in helping our young people and the students in our lives build this sense built into their hard watering in their bodies without relying on therapy for their whole lives in order to have these skills, right? So that's kind of our goal. And that's what's so wonderful about sensory modulation and sensory processing. So co-regulation is the concept that children and humans are developmentally wired to match our nervous systems to each other. This can go good or wrong. <laughs> it can go either way, right? Uh, Chil this is something that is really key though. Children are not able to independently regulate their emotions until around age eight. So until they hit the cognitive stage seven, age seven to 11, where they're in, what is it pre-operational thinking? Um, they are not adequately, adequately skilled to regulate their emotions by themselves. Does this mean that they have complete non 
self-control? No. It's saying that they really need support and practice co-regulating with a regulated adult on multiple occasions over and over again to learn to do it themselves. So until these, so that's pretty much the next slide, the next sentence, sorry. Um, this is important because I, I see a lot of kids come in at, at around age five having timber tantrums and parents are like, they're just not listening to me. They're just not getting it. And I get it. It's frustrating, but they're not supposed to at age five, unfortunately. At age five, I don't expect them to have it together by themselves. When we're starting to hit age seven, now let's talk because maybe they are a little bit delayed. But until around age seven, eight, nine, 10, 11, I really want to see kids practicing that with a regulated adult um, and using their adult as their calming mechanism, essentially, before I say, let's work on self-regulation. sensory supports in general, and in a, in a human body can be regulated at any time with the right support. So it's not yes. like, oh, we don't have the capacity to regulate at every point no. in our developmental, we can regulate, but it's really the reliance on the supports and the village around that child to provide consistent access to those sensory supports that allow that brain continue to develop that. So that's kind and of, it, it's part of our job. Yeah. And it doesn't have to be a lot of work. I mean, it feels like it is because it takes a lot of information to learn this, but at the same time, if we're intuitive about it, if we're taking care of ourselves first, if we're meeting sensory needs second of our child and ourselves, the dance becomes easier. You know, if we're looking at needs first and then looking at the problem second, it becomes a lot clearer. I don't know about you guys, but if you've been in an argument and you've said a lot of words you shouldn't have said and you regret them later, it would have been easier to get through that conversation if both parties were regulated first and then you had the conversation, right? It would have been more productive. There would have been less hurt words, et cetera. And that's, I mean, this is a lifelong practice. So do not feel any shame or any um, confusion because this is things we've had to learn as OTs and parents have to learn kind of the hard way, unfortunately, which is why we wanted to do this presentation because we want people to be supported and not feel like it's just picking and yourself up this, by the bootstraps. <laughs> a lot of this stuff is intuitive in that first, you know, stages of having a new, newborn. And we talk about these things a lot pre-vocabulary and pre-words and pre-education where it's intuitive that when your baby's crying and having a tension tantrum, we have to figure out what sensory supports. Do they need a swaddle? Do they need to be pat on their back? Do they need something in their mouth? Do they need something here? And you kind of go through this dance and you figure out when that dysregulated state comes up, how do we meet that sensory? The, the, the truth that we're discovering with occupational science is that um, that part of human beings is kind of present all the time. And whenever we're even on ourselves, our own little inner infant is starting to have a tantrum. We got to check in. Do I need do I need to actually drink some water from a sucky bottle? Do I need to swaddle myself? Do I need to do this? And if you do that first and you get that tantrum, whew, then now we can move forward and we can actually do some more conscious, more advanced, some more uh, problem solving from there. Is, so you actually do know how to do this as a parent. It's so hard to do it for ourselves, but you do, you've probably had so many like effective experiences meeting these needs for yourself and for others. It's just giving yourself that encouragement to keep going. So yes. That is Yana referred that core thing of like, unfortunately, the way this works, we got to put the mask on ourselves, we got to regulate our own bodies, our own minds have that, then we're going to be much more capable of responding to those things for our students. And this is for everyone that's working with students, parents, not foster parents, this is just the adult of every job. And honestly, learning these skills has helped me uh, with challenging coworkers and things like that. Like, Learning how to be a regulated nervous system is like magic that we all need. And once your body knows and trusts that you respond to these needs yourself too, you're going to feel a lot better in your day-to-day -day life. Things won't feel as hard and as challenging because it's like you're trying to move forward and do challenging things with only like a small gas tank there. We have to learn how to fully fill our tank, which isn't just mental health and 
consciously processing and affirmations, it's also showing up for our physical body regularly in the moment. So what does this actually look like? How do we actually freaking do this? Which often sometimes means working with a therapist because we can often also need co-regulation supports to learn these things. But um, it starts with developing a sense of awareness and presence in your body, tuning into that interception that you do naturally have. Um, I really like the mantra of wherever you go, there you are. Wherever you're in a room, no matter what role you have, your body is there with you and it's probably trying to communicate something to you. Um, in order to really perceive these things, it's very helpful to approach it with a sense of acceptance, gratitude, and non-judgment. We, in our culture, that is very harsh towards our bodies, towards our mind, especially if you have female body or some other kind of non-standard body, we tend to be very harsh towards our emotions, towards our sensations, really repressive. So it takes an active process to actually be in a state of acceptance and non-judgment about what our emotions actually are, what our body needs are, to particularly try to be cautious of shaming, you know, what our body is trying to tell us about what it needs. Um, so I included a resource packet here that really guides through for adults how we can kind of get some practice in that. And I'll show a resource that's really helpful on this next slide. Once can I just jump in? Yeah. One quick. So something that's really helpful for me as a, an adult doing this mindfulness stuff is um, my smartwatch, actually, because it tracks your heart rate. And it really helps me with my emotional, you know, recognizing my emotional state and my interoceptive state, because if my heart rate is dropping lower than normal or is higher nor than normal, I'm able to say, oh, there's a problem I need to pay attention to and figure this out. Um, because sometimes you have a feeling, but you're too busy. Like you're not attending to your own body. You're attending to everything else you're doing in the moment. And then you start having a feeling and it's just going to get louder and louder and louder until you attend to it. And so then when you stop and you use a tool, like looking at your heart rate or feeling your breath or feeling your temperature or trying to tune in, like, what is my stomach doing? It really helps you almost problem solve the problem and figure out what it is because our emotions are telling us information. Emotions are information. They're not wrong. They're not bad. They're not good. They just are. They're really our way of saying there's something wrong. There's something right. There's something in between. Right. And it, it's and often that something is a sensory need, which yes. no matter what, no matter how much great talk therapy you do, if your body is still trying to communicate a sensory need that hasn't get, gotten met, it's not going to really shut up or keep you, it's going to keep you in a, in a dysregulated state until we meet it. So that's why we need to add this as part of our overall mental hygiene is checking in with our sensory needs. And those are directly linked to our emotional communication. So as we develop awareness of our internal physical state and emotional state, we're going to get a little bit better at labeling emotions, which is an incredibly difficult skill, both for us and our kids on a large measure, especially if you're somebody like me that tends to dissociate from your interception a lot. Um, once you tune in, there can be a lot of voices at once and it's hard to individuate like which thing and I'm feeling all these things all at once. Um, it will be nice over time that labeling will start to come naturally of like, oh, I'm frustrated, I'm concerned, I'm tired, I'm numb, I'm distressed. Labeling may not come right away, which is why uh, zones of regulation can actually be a, an incredible tool because um, sensory systems also speak in arousal states and arousal states can be easily categorized in the zones of regulation, which is blue, which is low arousal, which is like tired, hungry, sad, um, green zone, which is when you are pretty regulated and you're calm, alert, present. Um, yellow is for up around upward arousal, which is like silly, anxious, agitated, um, concerned. As you get into red zone, that's when we're in full dysregulated blowout. Definitely there's sensory needs that need to get met when you are frustrated, tantrum, manic, all those things. These are all good cues. So even if you can't label the emotion, being able to label what zone you're in can be incredibly helpful. And this is where you learning to do this for yourself and starting to use this terminology with your kids 
is going to be incredibly helpful at home. And you're going to follow up what's being probably done at school because most schools are using zones of regulation. Um, and so in your PDF research packet that is in the link below, there is a copy of the visual zones of regulation and tools that you can have that's uh, freely available. As you get better at this work, you're going to start to track your triggers. You're going to figure out, oh, I get dysregulated when I'm thirsty or, oh, I'm cold. This is what this emotional state is coming from. Um, that's just going to come with time and experimentation. From there, you're going to start experimenting with integrating certain sensory supports that we're hopefully going to have time to go over that you can try. And um, you're going to hopefully learn to validate your own internal emotional experience. If you can get there where you are able to validate your physical and emotional needs, it's an incredibly empowering thing that we should all wish for our children is to be able to be the person that validates your own emotions makes it, it's just like a really healthy way to go about life. <laughs> I want to go back to the triggers. This process is super important as adults with children who might have their own sensory needs because sometimes our sensory needs conflict with our child's. So it's not an automatic given that our child is going to be exactly like us. Um, sometimes they're like our spouse. Sometimes they're like their biologic parents if they're adopted. And sometimes they're a mixture of the two, right? And so when that happens, that creates a lot of the power struggles and conflicts between parent and child because you actually have conflicting sensory needs. So it is super important to do this work for ourselves as the adult, because if we can find out that, oh, I'm noticing I'm getting triggered every time my kid is doing this, that, or the other, and actually I'm noticing that that means that they have this, that, or other need, sensory need, hmm, now what do I do, right? So then we start to meet both of your sensory needs. And then maybe we start to see these problems of dysregulation and power struggles decrease over time because everybody's needs are being met. So yeah. being aware, really, yeah. labeling, and then tracking when are these things happening? When, am, when are my arousal states happening and my emotions happening so that we can decide what to do next? And it really is like, in, in because this is our body's communication, once we can meet that sensory system trigger, it can get soothed incredibly quickly. You know, sometimes you can have a, you know, a screaming and shouting match or a fight that lasts, you know, days, months, years, um, but you can meet a sensory need in less than two seconds. And if that actually brings about that, you know, regulated state where you can then be creative, move forward, this is also modeling what we eventually want, like Olivia and I, when we're working with kids that have sensory needs, we're eventually wanting them to be competent adolescents, teens and adults that can be aware of what their sensory dysregulation triggers are so that they can, you know, calmly advocate with their boss, with their teacher about needing to take a break, needing to use their fidget what they're needing to do so that they can then take agency and power over meeting their sensory need because <laughs> like old fortunately as adults we don't really have a culture that's very sensory helpful <laughs> so we have to take you know do a lot of the heavy lifting to meet our sensory needs and long term likely our kids are as well by modeling this process we're going to get to a point where our kids can meet their sensory needs on their own um, i'm just looking at the chat so it's somebody asked can there be a disruption in a sensory system development, long-term functioning, even in a system supposedly already fully developed like auditory due to a traumatic sensory event. Yes, we all have a give and a take in our sensory systems and we all have moments of dysregulation, whether or not you have a fully functioning sensory system. So because of that, it can, you know, if there is something that is traumatic, that's information to take and say, oh, this was a lot for my body. It was way too much. What am I going to do to a get regulated to a regulated state from that? And then how am I going to handle it if it's going to happen again? Um, am I going to be around that train again? If not, you know, maybe no worries. But I mean, like, I work right next to a train track. And so, for example, that would be a big deal for someone who has a hard time with that noise. So we would have to figure out what to do next, right? Is first get regulated, then problem solve. And this is a constant 
thing that we need to be doing for ourselves and our children because we're always going to have moments of dysregulation, right? There's always the only constant in life is change. And with change comes stress and with stress comes dysregulation. And we just become hopefully more practiced at becoming regulated faster. Um, but that does not exempt us from struggle in life. Um, what? Hopefully sorry, that sorry. normalizes that for you guys, that um, whether or not you or your child have a sensory processing difference, it's still normal that everybody's going to have a struggle and needs to be attending to their sensory needs and practicing their regulation tools. Do you mind, um, do you mind if I add something in here? Yeah. Like, I guess part of what I've learned and what like occupational science teaches us is that, you know, our bodies all like all human bodies are kind of navigating a world we weren't designed for. And our bodies speak a very different language than our conscious mind is our body doesn't really know what a computer is. It doesn't really know what modern science is. It's having to adapt constantly. Um, and I want to say that one of my personal pet peeves as we are learning as um, the mainstream conversation around sensory needs, um, sometimes we tend to focus it, you know, maybe just on autism or something like that when really um, sensory systems are so incredibly important to every physical body, especially mammals, that um, we're underselling how chronic and acute trauma or for example, acquiring a TBI tends to be incredibly disrupting to the sensory system. And like a lot of those four folks need sensory supports clinically just as much as folks with autism or ADHD, or even having a totally neurotypical sensory system, but being um, in, under adverse childhood experiences and having complex PTSD, they need support and sensory supports for regulation. So this is broader than just neurodiversity. Um, I know folks with cerebral palsy also have a lot of um, sensory differences. So we really need to broaden this conversation. So I really like this. Um, it, this is a tool in the PDF packet, if you guys wanna use it, called the Kentucky Inventory and Mindfulness Skills. It just allows you to self-write building towards that interception skill set. So sometimes it's nice to take something where you have a baseline score and as you practice regularly, you can see how you're making progress and kind of track how your emotional um, awareness increases. Um, so we've kind of spoken on some of this already that, yeah. So how sensory needs connect with emotional regulation. Yes, we've already been discussing. So difficulty with sensory modulation is directly related to our capacity to emotionally regulate and our executive functioning skills. So sensory modulation is the concept of filtering sensory input. So we have a lot of input coming in from our world and we need our brain is the processing center of that and needs to decide for us automatically, is this important or unimportant? or is it important later? So I'll, I'll pay attention later and how much of that input to let in. And so when the filter gets clogged, meaning I have let too much input from my outside world too fast, then I get overwhelmed. I as in just anybody. And then if my filter is too, too small where I'm not letting enough input in, or it's kind of sluggish, kind of slow, um, that means I'm kind of unaware. I'm just floating through life, right? And that's also not a very adaptive place to be. And so those are the two extremes. So low registration, not picking up a lot of information and dysregulated modulation, picking up too much information that really sets off emotional dysregulation. And this is because, again, if we look at the parts of the brain, our executive functioning, our ability to use our thoughts and our mind to control what we do is at the front of our brain and it automatically shuts off. It's called flipping our lid when our fight, flight, freeze, and now submit, attach um, system turns on, which is our in, inner part of our brain, our emotional part of our brain. When that is turned on, we flip our lid, we stop being able to problem solve and think clearly and we go into survival mode. It is our adaptive way to protect ourselves, but unfortunately it turns on a lot when we have sensory modulation issues. 
And I, we are, like, you can tell probably that Olivia and I are so passionate about this topic. And that's why if you want more in-depth information about this, check out our presentation from last year. I, I am noting time. We're at yep. about 5.15. So um, from here, I'm going to kind of skip past this slide, which talks about how getting a balance in our re arousal state with our environment and it links to taking on challenges, which I'm sure hopefully you're sold that sensory regulation matters in order for humans to function op optimally. So just another point in that hat. We want to really make sure we cover this slide because it's often a big conversation in schools and clinics. It's like, oh, is this sensory or is this behavior? And uh, we really want to hopefully create a situation that when you have an escalated behavior or a power stru struggle or acting out, anything in that yellow and red zone, it's typically both. Yep, it's not ever cut and dry, is it? <laughs> um, and the reason we want to say this is because sensory needs are needs, not rewards. We should never be withholding something that a child's body needs to regulate as punishment for their behavior. Often the behavior is their body and brain's way of saying there is a sensory need. It's not always, okay? There are conscious choices children make, right? But a lot of the times it's interconnected. And if we can meet the sensory need first and then focus on discipline, things go a lot smoother. Um, and there are all sorts of ways to meet sensory needs because you're just trying to like, once we figure out, oh, this kind of proprioceptive input helps, this kind of visual input helps, this kind of temperature input helps. There can be all sorts of different ways, like called a diet of how you meet those sensory needs that it doesn't always have to be that you're meeting those needs through their favorite toy or highly preferred toy. And as our kids naturally age, we need to adapt how kids are meeting their sensory needs with different kinds of supports. So that like maybe in middle and high school, it's not a wiggle seat anymore. It's going and taking a bathroom break where you're doing jumping jacks in the hallway, right? We want to adapt so that over time, our sensory needs get naturally met by our environment and through repeated practice that our internal systems automatically start to regulate with the way that we've built in our day. Um, so this is where it's really helpful to partner with an OT. If you're not partnering with an OT, really like say if you are working with applied behavioral analysis for a part of your kid in home or whichever, if you can get OT and ABA together, it can really be a dream team and figuring out those just right supports. And I've included in the toolkit, one of my favorite resources for when you're getting into power struggles or like behavior things about how you as an adult, some ta practical tactics on staying calm and meeting sensory needs and implicit within that. Can I just, um, this is Yana, quickly ask, um, is there an app uh, that could be used as the you know, the, to track the forms that you were sharing before, is there anything that, you know, cause I know from my experience and somebody just messaged me asking me that, but I think to ask that, but, um, I knew that for me, if I had it on my phone, I'm more likely to record it than if I had to look for those forms or wait until well, I get, home. um, yeah, that's part of why I wanted to include the PDF resource. If like, if you want, it's an option, you can have them emailed to you. So you have it referenced in one place. So that link will have all the PDF forms there that, um, mindfulness, uh, index, it is like an automated calculator. So if you go on Google Sheets or um, Google Excel, you can say that all in one place. Um, but yeah, certainly it's web accessible to access these forms right. in one place. There yeah. are apps for the zones of regulation. There's a zones of regulation app and there's a mood, mood meter app. And I do suggest adults use it for themselves as well, because it is an, an app-based way to track your yeah. arousal and your triggers. We have so, other apps featured in the resource side. I don't know if we'll get to it, with, yeah. which is part of why I wanted you guys, to, if you wanted to, to have access to these slides so you can right. click on the hot links. Um, it's going to be different, the supports that everyone needs. And that's what's going I into, yeah. We can move, skip that side and just move straight to the well, support then. And that's kind of what I want. Like it feeds right into that. Getting Building a sensory diet is individual to each person and it's going to be a lifelong journey for discovering. So in the packet that you have, there is a um, support list. So I'll skip to that and we'll go back to these slides. So in that packet, 
has, um, oh gosh, I'm sorry. <laughs> um, we have the, that spreadsheet where you can get a baseline on developing mindfulness, um, some zones of regulation meters so you can learn what gets goes puts in those different boxes. But there is a um, sensory activities list based on sensory input area for adults and for children. Um, this is the link that you'll click in the chat to sign up to have that, those packets emailed to you if you'd like. Um, and on this side here, um, Gozen is a really amazing app for kids and adolescents, and I get a lot from their supports as an adult. Uh, Breathe, Think, Do is a great app for more the toddler age range of going through the secret sequence. Um, Happy Fi is another app. There's kind of endless resources, which is why it's figuring out your diet and what's going to work for you and your family. Um, but yeah, that slide is there. So sorry. Olivia, do you want to, do you think yeah. you have the ability to do this? Okay. <laughs> We've got a few more minutes. Um, I'm just going to kind of, let's glaze over them and then we'll leave room for questions at the end. How about that? For so sure. we kind of wanted to leave time for you guys to ask questions more specifically you guys about your sensory system. So I've listed triggers on each slide of each sensory system. Some of them are actually not triggers, they're signs of dysfunction. Um, so tactile and temperature are huge. The tactile system includes temperature, pain, pressure, um, soft touch, deep touch, et cetera. Um, and this is typically a big trigger we see with kids with sensory processing disorders that end up in our clinic. Um, so some of the common triggers are their clothing, their shoes, their clothing tags, their socks, um, anything to do with hair care. So they refuse to put a ponytail in their hair. They refuse to get a haircut. They refuse to get their hair brushed. Um, teeth care, so brushing and flossing their teeth is really hard. Anytime they get wet or dirty, anytime their clothing gets wet or dirty, um, touching any kind of craft, um, wet craft supply. And so Olivia, I'm wondering if we maybe focus on this on supports that tend to help regulate yeah. emotionally, because um, we probably have somewhat of an idea when these things are going kind of wrong, um, but maybe some common tools that help yeah. so kind of regulate. The child tools, I mean, simple ones are like this, like cut the tags off their clothes. A lot of clothes are now tag free because nobody likes tags, right? Like it's, it's a noxious stimulus to have something constantly moving on your skin because it's telling your body there's something on your skin, right? So it, it literally makes you feel like there's a bug on you. Uh, so that's a pretty normal trigger I see that I'm always like, well, just cut the tag off. Or and on just... the adult version of that, right? It's sort of like, hey, if there's an underwire in your bra bugs you, let's get, get the bra. cozy bras. Yes. Let's pay attention to, oh, hey, I tend to be a little bit crabbier if I'm wearing those wool socks that make my ankles itch all day. So with socks, that's often a contention with kids. It's kind of an expensive option, but Bombas socks are typically easier for kids to handle and any kind of running sock. So they were way more expensive. Like even I haven't bought them because I'm like, I don't want to spend that much money. But if you bought, if they're really obnoxious stimulus for your child and they're really struggling to wear socks to school, which we live in a state that's cold and wet right now and you have to wear socks most of the school year in your shoes, getting, you know, seven pairs or five pairs of high quality socks so that they have one pair of per school day and you just wash them every weekend wouldn't be a bad trade-off to do. Um, so any, again, any kind of running store sock that's more compressive and is really built to stay put on your foot, um, that doesn't have such a noxious seam. Um, and then just Googling sometimes, cause there's so many stores out there now that are built to provide sensory supports and sensory tools and sensory clothes. Um, it's an option. I just want to, um, can I do two quick tips for yeah. adults and for kids on this? Like, okay, self to close, I'm in my working office right now. And on my nice, like really cushy work chair, I have like a very fuzzy, nice soft blanket so that I'm often, when I get too cold, I can't focus on what I'm working on. So I have nice, warm, tactile blankets everywhere that just make me meet my tactile sensory needs and my temperature needs. 
Um, and one of the cool tips is if you can get in tuned with yourself, remember things that you enjoyed when you were a kid, and you might notice this in your kids. When we get dysregulated, we tend to age regress. So going back to supports that were comfort, comfy, cozy when we were little will work as adults too. One of the things we used in my family is called a rice sock, which is just like a dollar store tube top, tube sock with a knot not tight in the end and has some rice in it. And I'll heat it up in the microwave for like two minutes. And just getting that little bit of heat can have a way of just really making me feel safe, making me feel regulated after a hard day at work. So that's one of my favorite ones for temperature. I just want to say this is Yano. So yeah, like I, I know when we arrive home, like, you know, especially now in the fall where it's wet and cold and yucky, you know, the having soft blankets, we have at least two on the couch. We have one on each bed, just wrapping ourselves in the blankets or putting it on our feet. It feels so good. Right. And I know that when my kiddos are dysregulated or especially the younger one, you know, um, really a soft blanket, even though he says, no, I don't really want it, you know, and then I do kind of put it on him, just like, try it, just put a little mm -hmm. bit and then eh, it does feel good. <laughs> so that helps a lot. So we have lots of soft and plush blankets around too. No That's matter good, what. Wait, I, Yana, yeah. sorry, is that sometimes we, I think I had actually talked to Yana about this this week, is that our body is made to stay in homeostasis. And if our homeostasis, which means our normal, is in fight or flight all the time, we're going to fight calm. We're going to actually fight against doing the things we need to do to help ourselves, which is so twisted, I know. I could go on and on about the neurobiology about that, but just know that sometimes we have to give a little push for our kids to take the things they need. <laughs> just throwing that out there. <laughs> um. I, um, side note to that too, no matter what anybody celebrates for the holidays, or if you don't celebrate for the holidays right now, it's like fidget central, right? Like fidgets are so cool. There are so many tactile sensory tools that are like affordable. I usually get them at the dollar store whenever I do. And they're fantastic for adults too. So keeping our hands busy and having some way to discharge that energy and tactile uh, like oral stuff can be a little bit different but we have a lot of senses there too um that suckle reflex can be very soothing so having a water bottle with a straw that combines that tactile <laughs> input with a reflex um reflex integration is a cool ot thing that links into sensory systems um just in case we are super running out of time <laughs> i thought i would just go over this slide of yeah. some of the stuff that is really helpful overall and synchronizes all the sensory stuff. And then maybe in the questions, we can talk about individual ones that people have, if we still are okay to have a little bit of time for questioning. So if it's okay, we should, yes, run through this or, you know, wrap up the slides and, you know, within the next couple of few minutes, um, and then we can let, we will have to let our ASL interpreters go and we'll be done. And if people don't mind sticking around for questions and answers after the presentation, that would be wonderful. Thank you. I'll just go over quickly some of this slide and then Olivia, you can jump in too, is like some yeah. of the core ones is you want to hit those brainstem ones first. Are you thirsty, hungry, or like really in a bad temperature? Because those can be like quick, easy ones to fix that will just calm the whole system down um, and that we don't, we're not always um, aware of and we're in that fight or flight is like, you might need to drink something, you might need to eat something you might need to put a sweater on or take something off. Sorry, um, I'm just, I'm putting in, I see people's questions in the chat and I'm putting okay. in stuff. So don't worry, I'm not awesome. Go ignoring them. <laughs> You're fine. Um, so deep breathing, hard to fail with deep breathing. That on itself is gonna activate the parasympathetic nervous system and get your body more calm because it's gonna know it's not in a fight or flight situation. Doing things like tuning into your feet um, describing things in the room around you, getting more present, that's going to help, you know, getting in touch with those rhythms. Um, humming, singing, drumming, rhythmic music, rhythmic motion. Um, thing that really did it for me when I was a kid was learning hula hoops. If you get a nice big heavy hula hoop, they're a lot easier to use than those little flimsy ones at the store. 
getting that stable rocking motion is just incredibly calming rowing running um things that have a rhythm to them are naturally going to integrate the your whole sensory system there's something called balaviz x that's like a specialized exercise designed to meet all of the sides of the hemisphere hemispheres of your brain at once um it's a great one in general, physical activity, you can't go wrong where you're activating that cardiovascular system, you're going to discharge that stress response. And um, if you got somebody in your family that's in a regulated state, um, you know, consensual snuggles and hugs can be a really good way to help your kid regulate their sensory system, even without, you know, expensive tools and things like that. What okay. about lozenge? <laughs> <laughs> you know, oh. just, we, we use those as like, you know, we have Manuka honey lozenges that I, I bought in the store and I was as like a first aid, uh, when we were struggling and, um, I just have them in my bag and, you know, it acts as a distraction. There's something sweet, you know, they like, have really attractive chewies that are like nice looking necklaces. And um, I used to take like low cost uh, washing some t-shirts and I would cut them up and tie knots in them and make necklaces for kids because I hate chewies are so expensive. I get it that they need it, but there are other ways that you can get that nice oral input. Um, for tactile, I always like to suggest like hair ties, the flat ones especially for like boys, because you can get the black ones, they're very nonchalant and they can pull them and they can snap them and they can twist them in knots and untwist them. And it's a nice like covert fidget that's not a toy, right? Because um, a lot of times schools will be like, oh, fidgets are banned because they're toys and they're the cool new in thing. So I like to give options to kids that are more covert, there's something they can wear so they don't lose it. So that's my big one is hair ties um, for boys and girls, because no matter what you can have it on your wrist and you can play with it. And it's perfect for, if you are bored or trying to pay attention, or if you're nervous for adults, I mean, my favorite is using a straw in my water bottle, um, and just taking a bathroom break sometimes and splashing cold water on your face when you're needing a break. And this goes for the adults too. Like if your kid and you are having a problem and there's a power struggle or you're feeling dysregulated by their emotions, just saying, you know what? I'm hitting my yellow red zone. I'm going to go take a break. And then we can talk about this again. Um, and that's super helpful. And also helpful when you're having a discussion, a heated discussion with another adult, <laughs> like your partner saying, hmm, this is getting heated. Let's take a break. Let's go meet our own sensory needs and we'll come back to the table when we're calm. Um, yeah, so bathroom breaks are great because then you can just splash them on your face, pat your eyes a little bit. Um, what else do I do as a grown up? <laughs> um, the bathroom breaks can be a good one size fits all sensory regulation. It's always appropriate to advocate for yourself to take a bathroom break. Um, there's a resource I put from the crappy childhood fairy. I love her work is really great for a sensory regulation approach for adult supports, but she'll go to the bathroom and just focus on the warm water over her hands. She'll go walk into the corner so that the sides of the walls puts deep pressure on both sides of herself, which um, deep pressure tends to be very calming and soothing. Um, tapping and beanbag tapping. A lot of the supports around trauma for adults are naturally tacking into those sensory things. So even though we're not talking about sensory integration for adults quite yet, that hasn't caught up to mainstream, we're getting there. Um, a lot of the services and conversations around chronic trauma will naturally suggest some really good sensory supports for adults, just as a tip. 